As a lifelong Palace fan, there's no better feeling than walking down the Holmesdale Road on a match day. And up and down the country, supporters make a similar journey each and every week, hoping for three points and a shed load of goals. Preferably at the right end. But for most fans, it's not just about match day. Over time, a football club embeds itself in its community. And as memories are passed from generation to generation, legends are created. A club's history and where it came from is as important as where it's going. And it's not necessarily about trophy count either, which as a Palace fan is just as well. It's about who we are and what makes us unique as a club. Champions of Iran, 1972. Tonight, we welcome Southampton, who coincidentally just happened to be our first ever league opponents way back in 1905. Or at least that's what the history books will have us believe. But I think the history books are wrong. Crystal Palace, this Crystal Palace, is the oldest professional football club in the world. And I'm going to prove it. think is the oldest football team in the world across all the leagues? The oldest football team in the world? I can't even say one. Absolutely no idea at all. I was going to say Norwich but I don't know. Um... Uh, I've got no clue. I would go for something like Plymouth Argyle. Corinthian Casuals. Newport. Bury. I've got Bury as well. West Ham? Southampton. Uh, Notts County. Sheffield. Not United, not Wednesday, just Sheffield. Absolutely no idea. <laughs> I ain't got a clue, honestly, I ain't got a clue. The modern history of the game here in England is well documented. Amateurs Sheffield FC are officially recognised as the oldest surviving football club, and Notts County, formed in 1862, is the oldest professional club still playing today, albeit in the National League. And yet neither of those great old clubs were involved in the creation of football's original governing body, the Football Association, which as any scholar of the beautiful game knows was formed at the Freemasons Tavern in 1863 in order to establish a unifying set of rules. But you'd be hard pressed to recognise any one of the clubs who attended that first meeting, except maybe one. But confusingly, the FA's own website clearly states there's no link between the modern day Crystal Palace FC and those founder members who we had always been led to believe were just a bunch of groundsmen having a weekly kickabout. Although suggesting we're a championship club does indicate some fact-checking might be in order. Like most Palace fans, you originally believed the idea that the original amateur club was completely separate from the modern professional team. But what, what first made you question that assumption? The main point that, that made me question that assumption was a tankard I bought at auction about five or six years ago, which, um, this is the tankard, shows that it was presented by the Crystal Palace Club in 1873 to 1874. And it has the names of a couple of captains on the bottom. Now, the, the legend, as you say, is that there was a, an amateur side made up, made up of staff or ground staff of the Crystal Palace. And this tank would look much more sophisticated than you would expect to get from an amateur team of, of ground staff. But at, at about this time, five years ago, the British Library started digitizing its massive collection of Victorian and Edwardian newspapers. And whereas it would have been physically impossible to have gone through these millions of pages beforehand, all of a sudden you could search them with the search engine online. A very different story started emerging about the club. The Crystal Palace Company owned and managed the vast Victorian glass structure and its surrounding grounds, which attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors to South London every year. And just to give you a sense of the scale of the building, I'm stood in front of where designer Joseph Paxton's masterpiece would have been situated. 
And I've got to say, it's not until you're here that you realise just how impressive it must have been for those who made the trip. And at six pence a pop to enter, it most certainly meant that the only way that most of the local working classes got a chance to see the place up close was by cleaning the windows. The Crystal Palace itself was the world's first theme park. And like theme parks today, you paid your entrance money and you could spectate or participate in anything that was contained within the grounds. So anything that happened within the grounds had to be part of the Crystal Palace company's business. It wouldn't have been there otherwise. But despite such impressive surroundings, the attraction wasn't making the kind of profit that the company's shareholders were expecting. And the pressure was on to find new ways of enticing the paying public into visiting again and again. And having a football team to provide added entertainment during the winter months would have seemed like a surefire way to boost revenue. After all, these Victorians were forward-thinking men, not a bunch of old dinosaurs. These are a bunch of old dinosaurs. The Victorians were very keen on healthy outdoor sports. Most of the external park, which we, as we've seen in the photographs there, was taken up by the waterworks. Um, another section was the tidal lake where the dinosaurs are, which left one piece of ground at the bottom right-hand corner as you look at the map. They laid a cricket ground on in, in June 1857. Now, cricket was the major sport of the day, and serious cricketers, to keep fit, played football in the winter. And it was quite common for football clubs to spring out of cricket clubs. Which is exactly what happened at the Crystal Palace. And the likes of Frank Day and James Turner were key figures in the process because not only were they hugely influential and wealthy businessmen with a lot of time on their hands, but they were also members of the local cricket club who played right here from the mid 1800s. Win, win. And for a number of years, it seemed to go from strength to strength. Crystal Palace FC and its players were pioneers of the game. Now the FA have very kindly let me inside Wembley to view the original minutes book of the Football Association. And it's so important that we have to have security at all times watching the book to make sure that I don't scribble in it or take it home. Now, this is really exciting because if we look on this, on the second page, Crystal Palace, the original Crystal Palace Football Club. Frank Day is our representative at the first meeting. He then handed over the duties of attending these meetings to James Turner. And he is first mentioned a few pages in. If we just, not gonna lie, I'm a bit nervous doing this. So this is James Turner seconding uh, a proposal from Mr. Alcock to go more down the route of the Cambridge rules, so less on the rugby side of it and more the beautiful football that the current Crystal Palace obviously play all the time. That's James Turner there, so James Turner, he's known as one of the founding fathers of the Football Association. So this bit is interesting with regards to the FA Cup, because Douglas Allport, Crystal Palace captain, on these pages, you can see that he is suggesting a committee to uh, propose a cup competition. There's even a bit at the bottom where they need a silver challenge cup of the value of 25 old people's money. And Douglas Allport saying there should be a subcommittee. People love subcommittees, don't they? This would just be a, a different WhatsApp group nowadays. Cup emoji. Rules for the competition, 1871 to 72. The cup shall be called the Football Association Challenge Cup. The original Crystal Palace involved in the creation of the FA Cup. The driver of the FA at that stage was, was a guy named Charles Alcock who played for, for Forest, again, another one of the founding fathers of the FA. The Crystal Palace's captain, Douglas Alcock, was, was quite... Uh, the guy on the trophy. The trophy. Well, it was quite instrumental in this because he was the one who actually went out and bought the very first FA Cup. Crystal Palace played in that very first round. They played Hitchin of the FA Cup in November 1871. You know, we would be the only league club left who are actually in the FA Cup that played in that very first round. So we know that the likes of Douglas Allport, Frank Day and James Turner were a huge part of the creation of the Football Association and a few years later, the FA Cup. But what we don't know is how a team full of so many hugely influential trailblazers 
could just simply disappear without trace, just 15 years after the club was formed. So the club itself didn't fold. It was almost certain it had to give up playing football because it was damaging the cricket pitch. What the dig digitisation of the Victorian newspapers has allowed us to do, an analysis of the actual match reports and the fixtures, but they never ever played a match at the Crystal Palace after the end of February and in some seasons not even after the end of January, again because I think they were protecting the cricket pitch. Now, this is a perfectly reasonable theory because in 1892 the FA Cup final, which had been played on Surrey's kick cricket ground at the Oval, was booted out for exactly the same reason, it was damaging the cricket pitch. The FA Cup final had to then find a new venue. And what better venue to host such an important sporting occasion than the most famous Victorian attraction in England? The Crystal Palace Company spotted an opportunity to make a stack of cash and they took it. The FA Cup final would be played at the Crystal Palace for the next 20 years. And it became a, a massive day out, but of course that was only one day a year. And then apart from the odd England-Scotland international, here was a football stadium that was standing empty. So they must have thought, Where's that football club that we used to have? Exactly, so the Crystal Palace Company fielded the amateur side again, still in their traditional blue and white. I think I'm almost certain we played in blue and white because those were the external colours of, of the Crystal Palace itself. We played against the leading teams of the day, but we were still amateurs. And amateurs did not draw the crowds that professional football did. And this is what the Crystal Palace Company wanted. Crystal Palace already had on its books a man with vast soccer experience named Edmund Goodman and also W.G. Grace, the sporting director of, of the Crystal Palace, and started putting together this project to develop a professional club here at Crystal Palace. The FA were not very keen on having a football club linked to a theme park based in South London because another football league club, New Brighton Tower, which had been linked with a theme park in New Brighton near Liverpool, had been admitted to the league and then failed within three years. While Goodman and Grace, yes, cricketing legend W.G. Grace, were busy lobbying other clubs to back the idea of a new club, it seems the Crystal Palace company may have got the FA on side by creating a separate limited company that could run football matters independently and still fulfil its financial obligations to a concerned FA. So no worries about a theme park going under and taking the football club with it. And this separate company could have allayed the concerns of other clubs that the owner of the cup final ground could have an unfair advantage and just swoop in and steal their fans. But eagle-eyed historians have discovered that in spite of a concerted drive to attract outside investment, the company failed to attract enough investors and were forced to purchase the majority of shares themselves. So despite what they may have told the FA, the Crystal Palace company owned the football club just as they had in 1861. Most football clubs actually grew away from their amateur roots. Everton that sort of started as a youth club and Manchester United that started the Lancashire and Yorkshire carriage works. Crystal Palace actually grew closer to its roots and the Crystal Palace company became the majority shareholder and the manager through Edmund Goodman of the professional club. So I presume we were immediately let into the Football League Division One. Uh, no, in fact, we didn't apply to join the Football League. Why not? We, uh, well, for one thing, we didn't have the money. The Football League was professional and recognised transfer fees. Down south, it was still a largely amateur game. We applied to join the Southern League. So we were like, officially owned by the Crystal Palace Company at this point? Yes, the, um, when we turned professional, the Crystal Palace Company, they were the majority shareholder to begin with, so we were part of the Crystal Palace Company. The 1905 team, the major shareholder was the Crystal Palace Company. Mm -hmm. And as we heard earlier, the 1861 team, also owned by the Crystal Palace Company, mm -hmm. so that surely means that they're the same club? Yes, it was only ever one club because it was part of the Crystal Palace and part of the Crystal Palace Company's business. It wasn't a team of casual ground staff at 1861 and it wasn't a team of local entrepreneurs setting up a football club in 1905. It was always the Crystal Palace Company. Why in 1905 was there not a big thing made that it's this club from 1861. They did actually recognise their links with the 1861 club because if you look at the Crystal Palace Professional Club's first handbook in 1906, they mention all their previous amateur internationals. So they themselves saw the link with, with the, the amateur club in the past. I guess they had no idea what football was going to become at that point. No, they didn't. And it's ironic that today 
the, if you like, the one surviving remnant of the Crystal Palace and the Crystal Palace Company. The Crystal Palace Football Club is now the big crowd puller, the big money earner that the Crystal Palace Company always wanted it to be. And I'm sure it would have been extremely proud of what it's now, now achieved as a football club. But obviously, whenever you make a bold claim like this, there's going to be people that are going to have arguments the other way. So there's, there's the gap. We played until 1876, mm -hmm. then we didn't play again as an amateur side until 1895. Yeah. So it's around, around 20 years, the 20 year gap. Mm -hmm. How do we explain that when making the claim that it's the same club? You have to remember, first of all, the amateur club was amateur. So it wasn't contracted to anybody. It didn't play as part of a league. It played only friendlies. So it could play when it liked and, and as little as it liked. The fact that it chose not to play, as I say, didn't make it any less of a Crystal Palace club. The link is the Crystal Palace company because everything here was part of its business. And as I say, without the Crystal Palace and the Crystal Palace company, you had no Crystal Palace football club. Football is such an important part of our local history. And down here at the Palace, we're proud of our South London roots. And for well over 100 years, we've assumed that our journey as a football club began in 1905, in the humble surroundings of the Southern League Division Two, a club struggling to make its way in the football world. But at last, we know the truth, don't we? Now, you could argue that the 20-year gap between recorded matches means our claim could be open to dispute. And that is fine, but remember this. We both share the same name. We both played under the shadow of Crystal Palace. And as we've discovered, both incarnations were created by the same group, the Crystal Palace Company. That is a historical fact. Sheffield FC, Notts County, all those great football institutions are fully entitled to their place in football history. And so are we. Crystal Palace FC, the oldest professional football association club in the world. And now you can all argue about it. <laughs>